Geology is the perfect discipline for developing the student's observational and communication skills, and it's a prerequisite for the scientific method. The student will observe samples and then communicate the information to the rest of the class, whether it be written or verbal. When we study geology, we're going to be concerned with two general areas, rocks and soils. And it's important that your students understand that there's properties by which we can describe both. Color, texture, number of particles, size and weight. And it's important that your students understand that soils are necessary for the development of plants because they carry water and nutrients to plants. Another topic we'll cover in geology is the variety of the Earth's surface features. The fact that the Earth contains mountains and plains and rivers and deserts. Now let's take a look at some activities that you can use in your class. This activity is called chocolate chip geology and you really got to like your class for this one. What we're going to do is make an analogy, a comparison. A comparison between chocolate chip cookies and rocks. Chocolate chip cookies are, they have a certain color, a certain texture, they have a certain numbers of ingredients in them, as do rocks. So you should have a good sampling of rocks before you're ready to do the activity. If you don't, you might have your students bring a rock in, give them say two days to go out and hunt up a rock from their neighborhood and bring it in so you can make these comparisons. Another important item to have is a little magnifier like this. This is a four power from Delta Education. You need magnifiers to look at the particles in the rocks or as the case may be in the chocolate chip cookies. The night before the activity, you bake up the cookies and trick them a little bit put chocolate chips in some of them and, and other ingredients in different ones like plain cookies and pecans and so on. I've got three different cookies here and they have different ingredients in them. And when you bring these cookies in, hand them out one to each student and tell them to break them in half. I usually pacify my students by letting them eat one half as long as they promise to dissect the other half. And what you want to do is have your students look very closely at the particles and start breaking the cookie apart and seeing exactly how many different types of items are in these cookies and have them record their data. This is an experiment. They're observing and they're communicating things that they see in these cookies. And then after they've eaten half the cookie and and probably thrown away the first half. You might suggest that. Then you start giving them rocks to look at and you say, look at this. Here's a rock. It's got a color, it's got a texture, and it has lots of little particles in it just like the chocolate chip cookies. And then you turn your students loose with their rocks and their little magnifiers and you have them record the data what color are the rocks, what is the texture of the rocks, and how many different particles are in the rocks. Look at the data, evaluate the data, see if some students had the same kind of rocks if in fact their, their data agreed. It's a real good activity for a number of reasons. Number one, students get a better understanding of rocks. Number two, they realize that there's many, many different kinds of rocks in the world. And number three, you are working on developing their observational and communicative skills. Not to mention the chocolate chip cookies. I love them. Now, you've got all these rocks in your class. What are you going to do with them? First thing is to get a number or an initial recorded on each rock so you know where it came from and you can always get it back to the student that brought it in. Second thing is some great activities. Number one, you can lay out about five of them and have the students walk around and jot down on a piece of paper, working in pairs, jot down on a piece of paper characteristics of a particular rock, like rock number three is red, its uh, size is a certain size. How are we going to size rocks? That's a good question. They're irregular shaped. Well, you can make little sizing squares like this and you can see if the rock will fit through it or not. This rock obviously doesn't go through number two, so I'll presume it'll go through number three. Yes, it does. So this would be a number three rock. The students record this information. The color, the number of particles, the texture, anything they can find out about the rock.
And then you get them back in their seats and make an experiment out of it. Ask them which rock you're thinking of and you give some properties of the rock. Like it's a size 3 rock, it's green, it has three particles. See how many of your students can guess the right rock from their data. And invariably, a student will be asking you, what are the names of the little particles in the rock? Minerals. There's many, many different kinds of minerals. Let's take a look at granite as an example. Here's two pieces of granite. They don't look the same because of the different types of minerals. Here, the, the pink mineral is a pink feldspar, and over here we have more of a dull white feldspar. They're both feldspar, but they come in different colors. The quartz in the granite is clear, transparent, and the black particles are called mica. So you might just tell them about granite and name two or three minerals. Hefting is another good technique for identifying an important property of minerals, and it's a primary way to do it. That property is density, the compactness of the material. Some materials are very compact, their atoms are very close together, and other materials the atoms are quite far apart. That, that's how we determine which one would seem to be heavier if they were the same size. Two rocks here, hefting, seeing which one is heavier, using your hands as a balance. This particular rock, galena, is like lead. It's very heavy, very dense. This piece of scoria, like pumice, is almost floats on water. And you can really tell when you start hefting which one is the densest. So that's a good way and a good introductory to density because density is an important concept and an important physical property of all rocks. To go along with your sink and float activities, here's an extension of the hefting problem that we worked on, but this time we're looking at liquids and we're looking at relative densities of different liquids. What I have here, and you can do it either as a demonstration or as a classroom experiment. Of course, you should need enough samples for all of your students to work with if you use an experiment. This is isopropyl alcohol. You can use pretty much any kind of alcohol, and I put some green food coloring in it. This is very salty water water holding as much salt as you can, maybe a four to one ratio, four parts water, one part salt. This is regular tap water with blue food coloring in it, and this is also regular tap water that's clear. Now, as I said before, sink or float, we're going to develop little floating gauges. The denser the liquid, the higher something floats in it. And I usually pose the, the explanation that you're thinking about walking in mud or milkshake material and you're going to just kind of plow your way through it. Whereas if you're in water, you're going to sink in it. So if it's thicker, then you float higher. And we're going to make little hydrometers out of soda straws. The students can take soda straws and little bits of clay and a nail and start by putting a little piece of clay in the end of the soda straw and then add the right number of BBs and then another piece of clay to seal it up. Pack it all in with a nail. I like to use the back side of this nail. Pack it all down in there so you got clay, BBs, and more clay. And you make yourself these great little hydrometers that float up and down like an iceberg would because they're heavier on the bottom. Now if you put too many BBs in it, and you should test these beforehand and find out how many BBs you need to have, it will hit the bottom. We can't have that because then you're really not seeing where it's floating at. And if you put too few BBs in, then you may have this problem where it falls over sideways. So there's just the right number and you're going to have to test this in advance and you're going to have to test it with all three liquids. You have to have it float in all three liquids without falling over or hitting the bottom. And this one looks close. This happens to be two BBs, by the way. Now, here's the problem you pose to your students. You've got three samples, and you want to see how high this thing floats in each, and then you know that this is one of the three, but you don't know which one it is. And you want to know what color food coloring to put in this one. Okay? So take this card, and you can make these up in advance. All these things you can use year after year, by the way. Take the card. These are quarter-inch increments, and I numbered from 1 to 17 here. Of course, I had to check that in advance, too. Float the little hydrometer in the liquid and set the card right across the top of the cup and see how high the hydrometer floats in the liquid. And then have your students wipe it off 
and do it to the next one. Of course, using the same hydrometer, and it's also important that the liquids are filled to the same level each time because we're measuring from the top of the cup. And you measure the number for this one, and then you measure the number for this one. And then you say to the students, well, we need to know what color food coloring to put in this. So we're making a comparison, and then we're making an inference. We're recording the data for this one, and we're trying to see if it matches any of the numbers of this one over, of these three over here. And in fact, I like to use tap water as my unknown, so they will come up and say, this is the same as the blue liquid, we should put blue food coloring in this glass here. And then make sure that you go on and do that. Actually add the food coloring to reinforce the concept that you've identified an unknown by one of its physical properties, and that's density. And this is really a fantastic concept to be teaching at the elementary level. Talking about physical properties and density in particular because it is a really difficult concept to get across to students. And it's one that we really reserve for the junior high, but it's such an important concept that students should start to understand the basic principles of it very early in life. And this is a perfect activity for you to do it with. Soda straw hydrometer. An extension to the soda straw hydrometer activity and any sink or float activities you may be working with is testing a raw egg to see how it floats or sinks in your very salty water and in your fresh water. If we try it in the very salty water, we see that it floats. If we try it in the fresh water, we see that it sinks. Now, after you've shown this to your students, you want to ask them the question, which water would float on top of the other one? Would the blue float on top of the red, or the red float on top of the blue? We're working on some critical thinking skills here, and we're going to use a baster to test it. You may want to test it both ways. Try taking some red water and slowly pouring it onto the blue water, and then maybe try taking some blue water and slowly pouring it onto the red water. We're going to do that now and see what happens. Once we've made our double density layer with the two liquids, once again, we'll drop the egg in. But before we do, let's ask our students what they think will happen. Have them make a guess and then perform the experiment. What do you think will happen? Well, here we go. Besides the water overflowing on the table, we have the egg floating at the boundary layer. Remember, it sinks in the fresh water and floats in the salt water. Soil is just a fancy name for dirt, and this is what we're going to be looking at. Now, how can you imagine having fun with dirt? Well, you can. Get your fish tank out, load it up about three quarters full of dirt, get your kids you can do it as a demo, but you can get your kids to come up and do them one at a time. Have them build something for you. Show the class what a mountain looks like. Okay, let's make a mountain here. Build a little mountain up in our fish tank. Got a mountain here. You can talk about the difference between mountains and hills. You've got a valley in here. You've got another mountain over here. Build one up over here. You can really have a lot of fun in one of these fish tanks. In fact, you might have more fun than your kids digging around. Okay, we got, we got a little outline, a little relief map, and it's three-dimensional. It's not just a drawing on a piece of paper, this is a mountain. You've got it. You want to simulate the conditions as best as possible. So, what's better than to have a little rainstorm come by? A rain, a little rain, the sprinkles here, okay? And the students can get a good feeling about what's happening. It's a little mini environment. It's another model just like we've done in some of the other activities. What happens when the flash flood comes? The flash flood, the water hits the mountaintop and runs down and you see it cut a big trench in the side of the hill. And how are lakes formed? When you get a solid bedrock down there that the water doesn't go into and it sits in kind of a puddle and it builds up, and builds up a little lake bed. And where do rivers flow? The fact that they, the water runs off the hills and the rivers collect more and more and eventually they make it to the sea. There's really a lot of the Earth's uh, natural features that can be covered with a very simple aquarium model like this. 
More fun experiments with soils. Give your students a plastic bag to take home and bring back a soil sample from around their house, just like the rocks. And then do similar experiments. Classify the soils, observe the soils, write down information, get the little magnifiers out, dig around in the soils and see what you can find. If you leave the soils out in the sun for a day, any water in them will evaporate and you'll get a fog inside the plastic bag. You can compare relatively compare which soil has the most water in it by the amount of fog that appears on the plastic bag. Or you could do a full-blown experiment and see which soil holds the most water. Take soil samples from your class, take the same amount, and, and, and cut holes, bore holes in the bottom of the cups with a hot nail. Be sure and hold the nail with a pair of pliers. Hold it over the fire and poke, poke it in the bottom of the cup. And then pour equal quantities of water into each soil sample. Wait a while and then measure the water that comes through. And then of course the difference is the water that stayed in the soil. Now if you treat it like an experiment, first you'll ask your class what is the problem the problem, of course, is which soil holds the most water. And then the hypothesis or the guess is, well, let them guess. Soil one, soil two, or soil number three. And then do the experiment. Look at the data by measuring the water that comes out. And then formulate a conclusion from this data. You're doing the scientific method. Another good experiment that you can do with dirt.